Thank you very much, everybody, for showing up. It uh, really means something to me because I know I'm the only thing standing between you and dinner. So uh, thanks a lot for all being here. Um, so I, before I get started, I really want to highlight two, two people in particular who unfortunately couldn't be here because of visa issues. A lot of this work was really due to the heroic efforts of Yu Tong and Neilan uh, Abrahamson. Um, but um, basically, um, what I'd like to do is, more than anything else, kind of highlight why I'm interested in this question to begin with. First off, many of you, you know, m and myself included, kind of had this naive thought in the back of my head, like 1D area laws are solved, right? We pretty much, we pretty much know the answer to all of these questions. But it turns out there's actually a, one, there was at least one major gap that ended up showing up that appears after taking a look at it for a brief period of time. And this gap doesn't just show up for area laws, it also shows up for Hamiltonian simulations and many other areas. And that problem is we understand how to deal with bounded Hamiltonians really, really well. But when we start dealing with systems that have unbounded Hamiltonians, we run into nightmares. And so then our work, our major contribution here, is dotting the I's and crossing the T's and showing that for some classes of Hamiltonians that are unbounded, we can still end up getting uh, rigorous area laws in one dimension. And in my mind, this is kind of a first step towards, I think, extending many of our pieces of knowledge about the finite dimensional case for Hamiltonians to give us analogous understanding about what the infinite dimensional case would be. And that's really important for a bunch of different reasons. But before getting started, I probably don't need to say this to this audience, but what the heck, we've got the crib side, a slide here anyways. And so the question some of you might be having if you found the wrong room or something is, what's an area law? Well, an area law, gl glad all none of you asked. So an area law basically ends up quantifying the amount of um, entanglement entropy that you end up getting inside a system as you end up scaling the system up. A um, system that obeys a volume law has an amount of entropy that ends up scaling with the total volume of the Hilbert space. But if you're taking a look at a system that has an area law, it just scales with the Hilbert space dimension of the boundary that we end up getting in the middle. So in the case of one dimension, well, the dimension if, you know, uh, that you end up getting here is constant as you end up scaling the length of the line up and down. So it's, it's really kind of nice and easy in one dimension. So that's basically what we're shooting for. And one of the real reasons why this is important is because of its connection to uh, tensor networks. In particular, these systems that end up having um, low, uh, satisfy area laws can usually be simulated uh, nicely by uh, tensor network techniques like matrix product states, uh, DMRG, stuff like that. And so we'd like to really be able to characterize what systems have this property, because that'll give us an idea about whether or not a Hamiltonian is likely to be classically simulatable in general. And in particular, like, you know, um, some key results, the, the area law uh, discussion and I'm, I, I'm, uh, is deep. And I don't mean this to be a uh, uh, summary of, of obviously all of the area law results that are out there. But two of the important ones uh, focused on the one-dimensional case are uh, the following. The first one, I mean, we almost can't talk about area laws unless Matt Hastings comes into the picture. So the rigorous proof of a one-dimensional area law, to my knowledge, was first shown in this paper up here. And the technique uses a, a method known as Lieb-Robinson bounds in order to be able to uh, prove it. And uh, one of the big problems is that it... The, tech, the technique, well, Matt, you know, admittedly admitted that it probably could be generalized to degenerate uh, ground spaces, doesn't actually directly apply in that case. Twenty, uh, and also, it runs into problems when you try to apply it to an infinite dimensional uh, space. One of the challenges behind that is because with the Lee Robinson bounds, it ends up depending on essentially norms of commutators that end up coming in, and if the norm is infinite then this formalism doesn't really make any sense. You have to kind of think of some kind of truncation and show that you're not losing too much in a truncation in order to make that happen. And it's just that step well, really isn't there. And further, 
if we take a look at this approach down here, which uses a different way of going about it. The second approach looks at the area law through this concept of approximate ground state projectors. And um, it works actually in the, in the case where we have uh, degenerate ground spaces, but unfortunately, it also ends up requiring that our system have a finite dimensional um, uh, Hilbert space. And, um, well, there's a cutoff that ends up coming, coming in with it. If we take the limit as the cutoff goes to infinity, then things kind of go off the rails. So then the question is, well, how are we going to approach this? And, you know, what type of systems would we like to, or would we believe that an area law potentially ends up holding for? And so let me give you one of my favorite examples over here. This is a model known as the Schwinger model. It, it, it models quantum electrodynamics in one plus one dimensions. Um, and the um, basic idea behind it is you've got all of these individual sites that can uh, hold either, you know, an electron or a positron. You can just think about these as fermionic orbitals. And then in between here, we have all of these gauge fields, which you can think of as like an electric field between them. And all of this is coupled via a Gauss's law. And um, so basically, uh, what ends up happening in this case is that we have the energy of each of these fields over here uh, scaling like the square of the, the quantum number for, the, for each of those particular uh, uh, states. And so in, the, in theory, right, you can stick as much electric field as you think, as you want in a given mode. So those uh, modes that we end up having, like these link variables, technically can end up having a uh, unbounded Hilbert space dimension. So even though this is a beautiful one-dimensional problem, that in practice actually often tends to be quite easy for people to simulate using classical methods, it technically doesn't actually end up obeying uh, the theorems that we would like to, to use. So the question is, do systems like this one actually end up obeying area laws? And the answer that we're going to see is yes. Actually, an area law does uh, apply specifically to um, a lattice gauge theories like this one, the hybrid Holstein model, as well as SU2 gauge theories. So to give an idea about what we would like to do with it, fundamentally, the first thing that you, we would like to be able to do is we'd like to be able to say, we have all of these infinite dimensional vector spaces over here, and we would like to be able to truncate the field in t inside this range going from lambda to minus lambda, where these are cutoff values. And then we'd like to be able to somehow argue that we're not throwing too much away by truncating it. Of course, this is a major problem that we run into because of the fact that, well, what's the state doing? Because in principle, you could put, if you're looking at any arbitrary state that's put into this, it could have an arbitrarily large amount of electric field at each of those points. So for if, there will always end up existing some particular state that violates any truncation that we put in. So our task is here to show that if we're looking at the low energy properties of, uh, of this state, then the support of, uh, the say, the ground state in this is going to be extremely small for the extremely high uh, points in the cutoff. And uh, that's, that's uh, what's going to be able to motivate this. And so the one of the fundamental techniques that's used for this is Markov inequality-like arguments. So the Markov inequality basically ends up saying, if you're looking at some ra um, random variable, the probability of it being at most k times the mean is uh, at most 1 over k. And so what that ends up meaning is that if we can guarantee for the particular systems that we're taking a look at that the expectation values of these variables that we want to truncate are small, then we can rely on arguments like the Markov inequality in order to be able to say that wave function has to have a really small support at the top up here. Unfortunately, though, these uh, a direct naive application of the Markov inequality doesn't quite give us the results that we want. They're not, it's not quite tight enough. And so much of the art of this paper is going through making these same type of arguments, but in a way that's uh, precise enough in order to actually be able to get area law scaling in these cases. Okay? So... Uh, before getting started, there's a couple of uh, definitions, and uh, because this is a QIP talk, I decided to bombard you with theorems. I know, you're welcome. So, 
The um, basic idea behind this is that there's a couple of uh, symbols that we're going to be uh, seeing over and over and over again. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to take a look at um, a spectral, this concept of a spectral projector, which we're, I'm going to uh, denote with pi sub s. Um, the next the important thing is you'll see these lambdas flying around quite a bit in these things. Every time you see a lambda, think cut off. That's exactly it. What I mean is I mean for whatever local Hilbert space dimension that you're taking a look at, we're setting a cutoff value of lambda. And meaning that that's the maximum value that we're going to end up uh, considering. And then um, the, we're going to have this n of lambda over here, which you can think of as the truncated norm of all of the local uh, parts of your Hamiltonian within this space. Okay, so for a fixed value of a cutoff, there's going to be a kind of a norm for each of these local parts. And we're going to need in order to pay attention to that because that's going to determine kind of how strong the correlations are going to be locally between each of those regions given a particular cutoff value. Okay, then we're going to need to make some assumptions in order to make all of this go. First thing is that this obviously, the stronger this local norm is here, this n of lambda, the more powerful the interactions are going to be and the less uh, kind of an, of an area law like uh, character we expect. So we'd like those uh, interactions not to end up growing like crazy. So we, we demand that it scales polynomially with a cutoff. So these norms can diverge, but we just demand that they don't diverge too quickly. Polynomially is kind of okay. The next thing that we require, and this is, this is actually the, the more questionable part or the part that limits the applications, is that we need to be able to say for the local observables that we're interested in, the expectation value of those local observables in the ground state is a constant. So let's just go back to the previous example over here, right? For the case of the uh, Schwinger model, for our infinite dimensional uh, systems that we end up having in here, our local quantum number is going to correspond to the electric field that we have at each of those sites, okay? And so we want to we want to be able to argue that whatever the ground state is for this, the mean um, uh, electric field is at most going to be order one. And again, we care about the mean electric field in particular here because we're using Markov inequalities to save our ass. And uh, that, that relies entirely on the mean. So that's why, that, uh, that's why this assumption is here. Okay. And then what we're going to basically do is we're going to further end up assuming that there end up existing constants uh, that are set up in such a way, uh, chi and r, which basically end up um, uh, talking about how the growth of the norms of these operators end up uh, scaling as a function of the... Um, um, yeah, as a function of the kind of width of the integral uh, interval and all of the, the the lengths, and so basically we end up requiring that this scales like a power law for some power r over here and uh, satisfies this constant factor up here chi. So basically, every time you see chi and r, just think two constants that are along for the ride that you'll have to individually prove for each of the models that you're interested in. So we assume this scaling uh, holds, and we'll show that you know some models, like the Schwinger model over here, ends up satisfying it with those constants. But if all of those assumptions are met, then the uh, gapped ground state of the given Hamiltonian will end up satisfying a um, area law. Now, there is a bit major caveat with this. Our techniques fall apart in the case where you have a degenerate ground space. Um, it's highly likely, just like, just like Matt alluded to ages ago, that these techniques can be improved in order to be able to deal with a case where we have a degenerate ground space. But everything becomes much more sensitive in that case, and our current analysis falls apart. So we're going to uh, require that we end up looking only at Hamiltonians that happen to have a unique ground state. Okay. So how does a proof sketch? Basically, in order for us to understand this, we have uh, bound the error in uh, these, uh, or show that there's an area law. What we need to do is we need to bound the truncation error that we end up getting from setting these local Hilbert space dimensions to some value. And then we can rely on arguments similar to the one-dimensional area law to be able to deal with everything once we've truncated the space to the appropriate values. 
And, uh, and in essence, this really ends up boiling down to tail bounds for probability distributions. So one of the extensions that you know, could be valuable for this work is in cases where you had more information about what the probability distribution of the local observables were, you might be able to do, uh, give a better tail bound than many of these Markov style bounds that we're using. All right, and the analysis that we end up using in order to be able to give our tail bounds, which is based, inspired by Markov ideas, but it's a little bit tighter, is uh, given by uh, this work by Yutong, Victor, Albert, Jared, and uh, uh, John, and Yuan. Well, I guess, is Yuan the Chinese John? Huh. Anyways. I shouldn't be thinking these random thoughts right now. I should be giving a proper talk. All right. So then once we've done all of these, what we should be doing is uh, we should get these values and substitute this into the uh, 1D area law analysis uh, done using the AGSPs down at the bottom. And that's how everything ends up going. So in order to see this, what we need to really be able to do is we need to... Uh, crap. All right. We're going to be going fast this proof now. So the basic setup for this uh, ends up going as follows. What we do is we consider a left and a right segment over here. And we want to be able to compute the um, uh, entropy of entanglement between these. So I'm going to assume that this uh, section is uh, separated by a series of local systems of length s in between. So this part over here is the uh, system L that we want to uh, consider. Uh, this side is R, and this is sort of like a boundary sandwich between the middle. Okay. And so then what we want to do is we want to be able to truncate our system as well as do a restriction. Now technically, what, what I mean by a restriction is we want to restrict the uh, Hamiltonian uh, to just the subspace that's involving it. It's a little bit different than applying a projector, like you might think, because we don't want to have to deal with the possibility of having zero uh, values for the part that's projected out. So when I say a restriction, what I really mean here is that any parts that are inside the kernel of those projectors, we remove from our Hilbert space completely. Okay, and it's, it's that we need to do that just for technical reasons so we don't get confused about the zero eigenvalues. Okay, so this is first step that we need to do. We need to do this restriction of the space onto this lambda cutoff value. And then what we do is we take the rest of this junk over here, and now we truncate that up to level uh, t, meaning that we take basically all of the I, uh, parts that have eigenvalue greater than t and end up replacing that with uh, t. Okay, so those are the two types of truncations that we do, and we're going to have two errors that come along with it. We're going to call those errors delta 1 and delta 2. Um, then what we can, we can end up doing is we can actually uh, end up saying that, the, um, um, that given these truncation errors delta 1 and delta 2 on these two uh, approximations that are used, we can end up bounding then the um, trace distance between the truncated state that we end up getting out and the untruncated state by this quantity over here. So now everything really just basically becomes boil, uh, a question of, well, what's this value of t up here, which is the lower bound on this little t there, uh, and furthermore, what's delta 1 and delta 2? So for delta 1, we can just use one of the main theorems from this uh, Tong et al. paper. Using that main theorem, we get the following exponential bound on delta 1. Then, going through a very similar argument, uh, but using the subtriangle inequality fun, we can end up getting this type of a bound for delta 2. So delta 1 and delta 2 look very similar. They both uh, shrink exponentially. The only real difference between them is that there's a polynomial growth for delta 2 in terms of the length of the interval that we're dealing with. But we also get an exponential shrinkage, so it normally will uh, actually pay off. Uh, so. A basic idea is now we've got delta 1, delta 2, and they shrink exponentially with a cutoff. Now what we really need to be able to do is um, show, because we can make this trace distance arbitrarily small, by um, uh, increasing the value of s or the cutoff. And we don't have to pay too large of a price with this. So we have to now be able to uh, take a look at what ends up happening with the one-dimensional area laws given this. So in order for us to do this, we need to first uh, translate everything into the standard language that the one-dimensional area laws are proven in. And this requires this approximate ground state projector formalism. So uh, I won't bother, given the limited time, going over the details. But the key idea behind it is that you, by using a Chebyshev polynomial, uh, actually, 
because of the fact that Chebyshev polynomials fall off relatively quickly, uh, we can use the Chebyshev polynomial function of the Hamiltonian to project out everything but the low energy sector of it. And this is the, the function over here. And by the way, this for those of you who are um, um, quantum signal processing nerds like I am, uh, this actually ends up looking exactly like the kind of thing that you would end up doing to do an eigenvalue filter using step functions using QSP. So it kind of actually, they're, they're sort of like the QSP hipsters, I think. You know, they're kind of doing it before it was cool. But uh, in any case, what we, can, we do after that is we prove uh, this result uh, showing that if we have a sequence of, approx of uh, approximate ground state projectors with um, uh, values sigma and r, where r is the sh uh, uh, Schmidt rank that we end up seeing for our AGSP, if we have a sequence of these that uh, ends up uh, obeying uh, this, uh, this relationship here, then we end up um, getting that the entanglement entropy ends up scaling like the log of the Schmidt rank, uh, where R is assumed here to increase at most exponentially with the index of these over here. So what we want to do is we want to now be able to prove things about these se such sequences of approximate ground state projectors. And uh, basically, what we end up doing is through some robustness bounds, we can bound the gap of the um, truncated Hamiltonian um, uh, in terms of the uh, gap of the, uh, the original one, and uh, uh, ba lower bound the norm, which is, uh, can be related in terms of this uh, uh, truncated norm that we talked about in the first slide, the gap. Uh, basically, we're just multiplying it by the total number of subsystems. And this T value, which ends up abounding everything else. And then from the exponential falloffs on the um, uh, tails of the Chebyshev polynomial, when we start going towards the edges of it, we end up finding the following uh, scaling for sigma as a function of uh, L, which is the N that we had previously, that goes exponentially like this. So this exponentially scales just like we want. And on using the assumption that the average uh, quantum number is 1, we then can end up bounding a delta 1 and delta 2 using the previous arguments um, and use that value of t in order to be able to give us the scaling that we end up having over there. Substituting all of those together ends up giving us this following exponential upper bound on the error that we get in our approximate ground state projector, which shrinks exponentially with the sequence length as we required. And then just ripping this result off from the error at all result from 2013, that allows us to bound the value of R. And so plugging all of these things together, what we end up getting is we end up getting uh, exactly the type of scaling we want. And we find, you know, from the fact that the um, entanglement entropy goes like log R, that everything's all good. Um, so this ends up uh, basically giving us our proof that the gap, is, the entanglement entropy scales poly, uh, polynomially in uh, this gap over here, which in our context is a constant. So to give an idea of systems that end up having this, basically by using some standard convexity arguments, we, it's possible to show in a case-by-case -case basis that this mean quantum number uh, of order one ends up applying for a lot of systems. So we did this for um, the Schwinger model, found out it works, and the same thing we show for Hubbard Holstein. But to conclude, what we've been able to do is something that I think is cool. Now the approaches are relatively actually intuitive, but there's a lot of I's and a lot of T's to dot along the way when we're proving it. What we do is we show that there exist classes of, um, of one-dimensional Hamiltonians that have unbounded Hilbert space dimension that yet nonetheless still exhibit area laws, despite the fact that um, the results that you would get from naive um, um, Lee Robinson bounds would, would suggest that you might not. And so this um, uh, backs up what people have seen in practice by simulating these using tensor networks in reality, that it tends to work pretty well, but we don't ha didn't have the theory to back it up. And uh, further, it suggests that really, actually, there's a lot of further work and progress that can be done trying to understand these infinite dimensional systems. And while I talked about it here for this one dimensional case, I think that's not the end of this discussion. Understanding how simulation, Hamiltonian learning, and many other tasks end up working in this unbounded case is something that we haven't worked out yet. And it's, this isn't a trivial thing.
And I really strongly encourage more people to be thinking about this problem because there's a lot of intricacies that end up showing up here. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions and there's one right at the back there. It'll, it'll help with the recording if we get you the mic. Hi, um, I'm interested in your um, proof or derivation of the this order one um, uh, well result you have for yeah. for for the I, I think expe expectation value of the absolute value yeah. or, or or something. Um, so what, what does it mean order one? Because it must depend on on the parameters in the Hamiltonian, no? Uh, so what I what I mean specifically is it doesn't end up changing uh, with the length of the of the chain. So, for example, what, we, what we're interested in is we're interested in the expectation value of the local quantum number, i.e. like the local electric field. Mm -hmm. So we're not interested in the global energy or any property like that. We're interested in the local average of it in the ground state. And we'd like to have a system where that local average doesn't increase as we increase the length of the chain. Okay? And that's what we need to show. And it, it, it's, a, it's a complicated argument involving convexity of functions that we end up using for it. But ultimately, it's nothing more than a series of uh, you know, uh, applications of what's that guy's uh, inequality. Um, you know who I'm talking about, that guy. And, uh, and uh, also a bunch of triangle inequalities. Okay, thank you. So, so basically, it's an IR thing. It's an infrared. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Um, so, my first question is: Does this result also hold for a boston harper model? Um, uh, it'll hold from yeah. It'll hold for the bose hubbard model as well. Cool. Uh, and second question is, so for example, the, for the Schringer model, I would ex expect the Libra Opsin bound still holds because like the interactions between different sides is still like bounded operators. So I want to so talk about um, commutators of bounded operators, then yeah. there's still a Libra Opsin bound. The, so. problem, the problem is, and I would agree, if, yes, if, a, if you got a commutator between bounded operators, that would be cool. But the problem is that the local electric field that you have at each of those sites before truncating is unbounded. So technically, you need a truncation argument before you could do it. What we could have potentially done is use the Lee Robinson argument after the truncation instead of the approximate ground state projector formalism. But unfortunately, we can't just naively apply LRB. I see. Thank you. So you mentioned um, a few examples where you showed that your results apply, and there was also the last question for a different example. Um, but I was wondering, can you use your proof and the assumptions you make to kind of construct counterexamples, to construct models that fulfill the volume law? Yeah. I mean, I, that's an excellent question. It's one of the things that you always have to struggle with when dealing with bounds that you end up getting because you know a bound an upper bound diverging doesn't imply that the lower bound all or the best lower bound also diverges so it can point to situations where at the very least we can say we don't know which might be valuable but um, but at the moment yeah i wouldn't i don't think i can say anything about what a necessary and sufficient condition would be <laughs> 